if y'all can see that, we are in our um, last of our series as we're talking about really other brain disorders and how they affect the brain. Today, we're going to really deep dive into several different brain disorders, traumatic brain injury, chronic um, traumatic encephalitis, normal pressure hydrocephalus, epilepsy and seizures, um, a lot to really cover. And as we talk about these, we'll talk about symptoms, um, signs and symptoms and risk factors for some of these, but also what it looks like to diagnose and treat some of these disorders that we can have. We are the James L. West Center. Thank y'all for being here. Um, the West Center is a faith-inspired, not-for-profit organization, and we serve persons that are impacted by dementia. So this is those that are diagnosed with a dementia, their families, friends, any other informal caregivers that may support them, um, and then professional care partners as well. We do that through our education program. We also have our long-term care community and our day program that we are actively to get back open in spite of COVID. We are offering uh, one hour for nursing, social work, and licensing. Follow-up email this afternoon um, for which will you'll have a copy of these slides a copy of the recording and the information on how to obtain your CE credit with the link to the evaluation that you'll need to complete for this program. And then within a couple of weeks, usually two to three weeks, we'll um, get out those CE certificates to you in your email address. And again, that'll all be explained in that follow-up email. So like I mentioned, we're talking about these five um, disorders, brain disorders, and really how they affect the brain. You know, with dementia, um, when we talk about dementia, there are your neurodegenerative progressive dementias, like an Alzheimer's type and vascular and Lewy body types dementia. And then you have um, these other brain disorders that do affect brain health, but they may, may or may not become a progressive dementia. But we certainly want to know what all of these things, disorders, um, illnesses that can affect our brain. I was talking to somebody just this weekend um, when we have a symptom that might scare us or um, a loved one might have a symptom that might scare us. Um, we're very easy to jump to conclusions on what it may or may not be. Um, particularly as we are able to go onto Google or the internet and start typing in those symptoms or um, anything that we have, and all these things can pop up and we can easily um, jump to conclusions and be scared on it may be this or it may be that or that. Um, so it's thank you all for being here to learn more about these different types of things. But I do want to say um, whether you are concerned for yourself or for a loved one or you're just acquiring more knowledge, the importance of talking to a trusted doctor about anything that you may um, have that is concerning or that's different. Um, and really telling the doctor, that trusted doctor, that group of doctors you may see, telling them everything. Uh, we don't wanna, you know, sometimes these can be embarrassing or we may not think certain symptoms might correlate to other things, but the doctors really need to know everything that's going on with us, anything that's new or changed or it's been on going on for a long time, because they would have the ability to order the right tests or um, the certain type of treatments that they might want to try. And if they don't have all the information, then they may not be asking for certain tests that you may need or may not need, um, or if you're advocating for somebody else. So it really is important to talk to or tell the doctors everything, whether you think it's important or not they'll be able to deduce this. They went to school for many years um, and know uh, what's out there and the best course of action to get diagnosed and get that proper treatment. So we'll talk again about all each one of those different disorders, but we'll talk about causes and symptoms, how they affect the brain, um, what it looks like to diagnose this and treatment options as well. Um, and I have listed some resources at the end of this, um, the slide, so you'll get those, those um, extra links um, to different resources for each one of these brain disorders. We're going to start off with traumatic brain injury. And TBI, I'll call it TBI, um, this is really, it's a blow or a jolt or a hit to the head. Um, 
not every blow or jolt or hit um, is going to result in a traumatic brain injury. What it's looking like if there's repetitive blows or jolts, um, those are the major risk factors for a traumatic brain injury. And there are different severities of a blow or a jolt. It can be, you know, pretty mild um, up to a very severe head injury. Um, but when we have a repetitive or reoccurring uh, or more than two or three um, jolts or blows to the head, it looks, it's starting to look like those are um, being more diagnosed as a chronic traumatic encephalitis, which we'll talk more about here in a second, but that's what that CTE stands for. Um, from, this is from the CDC, but from 2006 to 2014, the number of um, TBI related emergency department visits or hospitalizations um, in deaths increased by 53%. And so we're seeing more, I, I don't know if it's, we're seeing more of them, but we're also better able to diagnose it. Um, as well and understand what um, could be the possible cause of those increase of emergency visits or deaths. Um, but individuals who survive a traumatic brain injury can um, face effects that last a few days um, or it can affect the rest of their lives. Again, depending on the severity. And there is a, a wide range um, and a wide severity of symptoms. Anywhere from physical symptoms you might see but to cognitive and emotional symptoms as well. They can appear immediately after the um, blow or jolt, or they can appear several days or several weeks after you have the blow or jolt, the initial jolt to the head. And in disrupting and normal functioning, again, it's mild to severe, depending on the injury, um, but it can be temporary. It can just be a brief change in mental status or maybe cognition or physical status, headaches or something. Um, all the way up to more severe injury, like there was a bruise, there's torn tissue, maybe there's bleeding as well. Um, particularly if you had an extended period um, of unconsciousness, there might be some, or an extended period of memory loss. It's more than just disorientation, or I don't remember the actual event, uh, but there's more memory loss after the event that happened, um, or other physical damage to the brain that can be more long-term. This um, image, you know, it kind of shows a, a couple of different ways the brain can be injured um, because you can, you know, the brain's just sitting in our skull in fluid. Um, so it kind of is able to move around in there, which I think can be a good thing unless there's um, an injury to it because you can, if you have a, a bolt or a jolt or blow to the head, the brain can uh, move around too much to where it hits the skulls. Um, you know, whether it's the front or the back, but the brain can also rotate inside the skull as well. Again, I think it's protected by all that fluid for a reason. Um, that fluid's protective among many other things that it does. Um, but again, if it's too much and if there is that severe injury or that severe movement, you know, a car accident's a great example. And I've experienced this myself. Um, you know, that whiplash where you're just uncontrolled moved and your head is moved and jolted and jerked and that brain can um, move too much inside the skull or the fluid was as protective as it can be, but only up to a certain point or even that rotation within the skull as well. So looking at physical and sensory symptoms that you might see um, after a traumatic brain injury or that blow or jolt to the head. Again, you can see these symptoms appear immediately after the event, or it can take several days or even a couple of weeks to see some of these symptoms. But mild symptoms you might see physically um, or sensory is a headache, um, nausea or vomiting, fatigue or drowsiness, uh, problems with speech or slurred speech, um, not able to find the word that you're looking for, dizziness, um, poor coordination or loss of balance, sensitive to light or sound, Blurred vision, ringing in ears, um, a bad taste in the mouth. Sometimes it's described as a metallic taste within the mouth. And then your ability to smell is off. Maybe you're not smelling like you used to. Those are mild. A severe symptom can be any of these mild symptoms that persist or they worsen. So on the onset of these mild symptoms, if they continue to last for days or weeks at a time and they, be content, or they continue to worsen, that would be a severe symptom. If you had a loss of consciousness, of course, whether it was just minutes or hours, um, if you did have a seizure or convulsion, which we'll talk about, 
dilation of the pupils, um, any liquid, clear liquid draining from the ears or the mouth, um, excuse me, or the nose. Also coordination, of course, but there's weakness um, or tingling, um, maybe even some numbness in your fingers or toes and not able to awaken from sleep. So symptoms of cognitive and behavioral um, changes in somebody after um, a traumatic brain injury, again, there's the mild symptoms. So you might have some loss of consciousness for a few seconds to a few minutes. Um, not losing consciousness, but being in a state of disorientation or just confused, being dazed. Memory or concentration problems, mood changes or mood swings, depression, anxiety, difficulty sleeping, or sleeping more than usual. Um, so again, these are mild, but if these mild symptoms persist for days or weeks at a time, or they continue to worsen, um, this would be severe. Also, if you're not able to recognize people or places, profound confusion, that's not clearing up, um, agitation, combativeness, any unusual behavior, slurred speech or coma. And these are severe symptoms. So we had the physical ones and now you have your cognitive and behavioral symptoms. In the past 30 years, um, research has linked moderate to severe brain injuries to increased risk of Alzheimer's disease or other progressive dementias. Um, and this can be years after the original head injury. It's typically as they're looking at this and discovering this more and more, it's not you have that um, brain injury and then you're starting to see symptoms of dementia, Alzheimer's disease or related dementia. It's usually years afterwards. It's just really increased your risk um, or can increase your risk for developing a progressive dementia. Repeated brain injuries or traumatic brain injuries are associated with chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association is showing that people who experience TBEs earlier in life, early to midlife, um, are two to four more times um, at higher risk for developing um, a dementia in later life. So that goes with what we're learning here. And the risk, um, or excuse me, the causes and risk factors of why TBIs, of course, causes. There's falls that happen. There's car accidents that happen. And there's other violence, unfortunately, that happen. Sports injuries, um, explosives or blasts or related injuries, just anything that we might come in contact with that could damage our brain. Um, just not wearing that seat belt or not wearing the helmet when you're riding a bike or a motorcycle. Um, all of those things would cause a traumatic brain injury. Risk factors, um, however, in the general, we break them up into age groups here, um, are children and newborns between the ages of zero and four um, falls. And these are hard falls. I mean, I know children's between zero and four fall a lot um, and they have protective um, stuff around them, but these are severe falls where they hit their head or they fall from a, um, a high place to a low place. Young adults between 15 and 24, um, our lack of awareness, or not awareness, but our lack of um, Risky behavior, not really seeing things as risky. So we take more risks um, between the ages of 15 to 24. So you see more sports accidents or, um, you know, that feeling of I'm invincible. I don't need to wear that helmet. I don't want to wear that helmet type thing. I'm not going to put on my car or my seatbelt. Um, and just, um, I wouldn't say poor judgment, but we're still developing that frontal lobe in those ages. Um, so our, our, um, Impulse control might not be there, um, so we might be more car accidents or just have more risky behavior. Um, and then, of course, we do see, unfortunately, more violence in that age, um, being struck by something or being struck um, against something. Intentional, of course, unintentional harm as well. Adults 60 um, and, and older, 60 and up, um, we're more prone to falls at that age. Car accidents, again, um, as we get older, we're not processing things as faster, so we might not see that car coming or not hit the brakes as fast as we might have when we were a little bit younger. So that increases our risk as well. And then males in any age group. Um, males, more males tend to play more sports, especially high impact sports like football, um, boxing, things like that. Car accidents. Um, they tend to take more risks as well. Um, also, uh, I think there are more men motorcycle drivers than there are women, um, typically. Uh, in combat, military, things as well. 
and falling off high objects. So they're generally the ones that are on top of the roof or climbing that ladder to fix something. Um, and they're just more risky behavior um, as well in males. So those are your risk factors and your typical causes for a traumatic brain injury. I'm gonna talk about chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So again, this is somebody that has reoccurring or what we're seeing is somebody has reoccurring TBIs um, over the course of time, but CTE is a progressive and fatal brain disease. And it's associated with repeated head traumas. Um, and those repeated head traumas are associated with the development of a progressive dementia. So somebody that has a traumatic brain injury or one or two doesn't necessarily, I mean, it does increase your risk for developing a, um, really, a progressive dementia, but what they're seeing here is this chronic traumatic encephalopathy um, is, has a much higher risk. It is associated with developing a dementia. It's still um, really not well understood. There's still a lot to be, um, to be learned about it, um, and it's rare for right now because I don't we don't understand it as much, so it's not diagnosed all, um, all that often or all that well. It's also pretty hard to diagnose, which we're going to look at here in a second. Um, we're still trying to understand how repleted blows to the head can cause a progressive dementia. Um, this is anywhere for how many head injuries you might have had to the severity of those head injuries. Um, and I also want to put in there is also, I think, the individualistic um, or just how we're all individuals and how our bodies are able to cope with um, injuries, whether it's any type of injury, brain injury or anything, but how we're able to cope with it physically, but also emotionally and behaviorally play an effect to this. So it's hard to diagnose. But CT is found um, uh, more commonly in the brains of people who play high, high contact sports um, like football, including boxing as well. We're also seeing it occur more often in military personnel um, who were exposed to blasts or exposed to um, explosions. Signs and symptoms are thought to include difficulties in thinking and cognition, physical problems that we, that we um, talked about earlier, but emotional problems and other behaviors. And it's thought that these symptoms develop years to maybe even decades after um, the head traumas occur. So it's again, it's not an immediate thing that we might see, or it's a mild symptom that will um, clear up, but it might be years later that we just start to see these more severe symptoms pop up. Um, and right now, CT cannot be made as a diagnosis during life, um, except in those rare individuals who have high exposures. Um, and, you know, we're looking at people that play high, high contact sports or high impact sports. We really don't know that, um, don't fully know the under or understand the causes of it, um, but there is not a cure we do know for CTU right now. Um, this dementia, and I'm not totally sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but pugil pugilistica, um, it is a type of dementia um, that we see more often in amateur and professional boxers, wrestlers, um, and other athletes that have, who have suffered concussions over the course of their career. Um, it is a variant of the chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, and it used to really, what we called CTE, we just called it dementia pugilistica. Um, we're starting to understand it more. And again, this, we're saying this is a variant. So we're seeing different um, severities or different types of CTE. But this is one that we, I think we probably know the most about it. Um, because we are, have been seeing it in boxers that do have um, chronic traumatic brain injuries. The symptoms um, and signs of this develop progressively over, um, over a long period of time and sometimes, again, amounting to decades. So, you, again, you may not see it immediately, um, but it's over years of time you're starting to see these symptoms, with the average onset um, being about 12 to 16 years after the start of a career in boxing. And people that are in boxing don't have necessarily really long careers anyway. Um, you start, typically you start when you're pretty young and you retire when you're pretty young. Um, so the condition is thought to affect about 15 to 20% of professional boxers and other, um, other sports that we're starting to, they're starting to research. And it has to do with concussions against those blows and jolts to the head um, over and over again. You also see it common in quarterbacks, wide receivers, hockey players, um, sometimes catchers in baseball, you might see it in getting hit um, with the ball or maybe possibly with a bat. 
um, but is, you know, the condition is caused by repeated concussive um, blows to the head. So CTE symptoms, um, there are not specific symptoms linked to CCE or CTE. And um, because we don't know a lot about it, it still is in the early stages of discovery and figuring out what it is, the causes and symptoms and risk factors. Um, we're still figuring that out, still in the earlier stages. But they're, they're listed here, difficulty thinking, memory issues, impulsive behavior, depression or apathy, having a hard time planning or carrying out familiar tasks or day-to-day -day tasks, um, much see change it in motor movement. So this is coordination just within your coordination of your body, but also balance issues as well. Emotional stability or instability, um, substance abuse, and suicidal thoughts or behaviors. So a lot of these symptoms are the same symptoms that you see in somebody with another um, dementia, like an Alzheimer's disease or a vascular dementia. Ones that kind of stand out um, a little bit more might help a, um, help a doctor or diagnostician kind of pinpoint to what type of what we're dealing with here as far as a brain disorder um, is the, the motor movement imbalance that you see early in the disease state. Um, substance misuse or abuse maybe um, can be one of those. The, um, and then the suicidal thoughts and behavior. It kind of stand out, but they're also, um, those are all symptoms of dementia. So you can see how it might be a little bit hard to diagnose this. But we have the, um, the brain imaging here on the screen because um, you have the control brain, somebody with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and then somebody with Alzheimer's disease. So it's hard to kind of diagnose maybe what's going on specifically. We know there's changes. We know there's some brain changes happening um, and it's progressive. But being able to tell you pinpoint exactly what they're living with might be hard. Um, a lot of it will come back down to um, history, um, history of the person. So there is not an official test to tell you um, or to diagnose CTE until autopsy. And that's when they can look at it. And what is um, suspected is that the tau protein, which is the same tau protein that persons with Alzheimer's disease have, um, the, but this tau protein buildup looks different because the the buildup of the tau protein is more around the blood vessels of somebody that might have a CTE, whereas Alzheimer's, the buildup of that tau protein is generally inside of the neuron. Um, so it's the same buildup, but just kind of where it's building up is a little bit different. But they will do, um, you know, what's your history? Do you have a history of repeated head trauma? What's your career? Um, or what did you do growing up playing sports or something like that? But a medical history, neurological exams, brain imaging to rule out any other causes, um, mental status testing, which is the same diagnostic um, procedures we would do for an Alzheimer's disease or a related dementia. Uh, the brain imaging um, advances have allowed us to see um, to see to show studies that CTE is distinct from Alzheimer's disease. And I think a lot of that has to do with the buildup of where that tau protein is. Um, how we treat that right now is through symptom. Uh, symptom management, which is the same that we do for persons with Alzheimer's disease or a related dementia. Um, there might be some medications that can help ease the symptoms, but we're not able to modify or change the disease in any way. So we help ease the symptoms. Yeah. And still a lot of research is still needed um, for the treatment, the diagnosing, um, and the understanding of this disease or disorder. So now there's normal pressure hydrocephalus. Um, in normal pressure hydrocephalus is a buildup of the cerebrospinal fluid inside of the brain's ventricles and cavities. Um, this causes the brain to, the ventricles in the brain to enlarge and that fluid buildup puts a lot of pressure on the brain. And it, when there's a lot of pressure on the brain, it can make, cause brain changes and disrupt um, how those neurons work and to disrupt the functioning um, of the brain. Normal pressure hydrocephalus can occur in people in any age, but you most commonly see it in persons um, 65 and older. It is believed to be about 5% of all cases of dementia. Um, and there are different things, there are different kinds of hallmark signs that can help us distinguish uh, what this type of dementia might be or what type of test to, um, to do to see if, we, if this is the type of dementia somebody might have. Um, but it can be caused by a ruptured aneurysm buildup of the fluid, head trauma, 
traumatic brain injuries, an infection of some sort, tumors, complications from surgery, um, but there are also causes that are unknown that can cause this fluid buildup in the brain. And here's what this looks like. So you have, you can see the ventricles there in the middle. Um, and then, uh, you know, on the left-hand side, that's normal. We have these ventricles and cavities um, that have our gray matter and white matter and other chemicals that help keep the way, the, the two hemispheres of our brain wiring and firing and working together and functioning properly. But you can see a big difference there um, with somebody with normal pressure hydrocephalus and how much those ventricles are enlarged um, just by the fluid, that cerebrospinal fluid build up and putting all that pressure on the brain. What we typically see as those first signs for this um, are you do see a, a decline in cognition, um, in concentration, and some memory um, as well. What's, what's different as far as symptoms go for a not normal pressure hydrocephalus as opposed to an Alzheimer's type dementia for sure. Because with um, Alzheimer's, you do see cognitive impairment, you see memory loss and you see concentration uh, issues. But what you see with MPH is a loss of bladder control early on. So they start to become a little bit incontinent very early, very early, uh, or that urge incontinency um, to where it's, you feel that urge to go and you gotta go right now. And if you don't make it within the next minute, then you'll be incontinent there. And then the other kind of hallmark sign for this one is poor balance. Um, you might, they're falling a lot more often. So they're really unsteady on their feet. Um, there you, you notice their gait changes. Um, so they might shuffle their feet or taking a lot shorter steps. Um, and people have reported that they feel stuck, um, like their feet are kind of just planted there and they feel stuck and they can't move them. And then you can also see a slowing of their movements overall. So starting to getting up to start to move, to take that first step, um, just being able to make a turn, um, you can see that just slowing and it's an uncharacteristic and sometimes kind of an odd thing to watch if you're not seeing, you know, if this is the first time you're seeing this. But again, other symptoms um, can look like those of Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease because you see um, that motor movement change a little bit as well, but also the confusion, the memory loss, all those things. And this can go unrecognized if, um, or the normal pressure hydrocephalus can go unrecognized if we're not treating it or we're not getting an early diagnosis. So when we start to see changes in our loved ones, our clients, ourselves, um, like I mentioned earlier, we really wanna go talk to the doctor and give them everything um, and not have to jump to conclusions. I know we do, but try not to jump to conclusions, I should say, because um, we want to make sure we're getting the right diagnosis for all of these disorders and the ones we've talked about in the past. Um, the diagnosing can be pretty intensive and it can take a long time because it is a ruling out process. I want to rule out it's not a bunch of other things um, before I get that probable diagnosis and then what's the best treatment option for that. Um, a lot of the MPH or normal pressure hydrocephalus can go um, unrecognized. And the longer it goes unrecognized or the longer it goes untreated, um, the more damage it's going to cause. And it's also a risk for you can't really treat it. With this particular dementia, um, this is one of the only causes of dementia that can be controlled or reversed with treatment. Um, so the testing here, it looks like you're going to do a brain scan. They will do a spinal tap or a lumbar uh, catheter to see what kind of, sorry, to see um, if there's any type of extra pressure or monitoring in the brain, neuropsychological tests, because um, they're going to want to rule everything else out, right? Um, but if we don't get these symptoms treated, um, it can, there can come a point where it cannot be treated um, or it's not, we can't reverse it. And then it will become a chronic progressive um, terminal diagnosis. Even early diagnosis, again, you can improve. Um, it can improve. You can have complete recovery or a partial recovery, depending on how much damage has already happened to the brain. So like I said, it's one of the few causes um, of dementia that can be controlled or reversed. And how they do that is they put a um, stunt or a shunt in the brain to release that buildup of that cerebrospinal fluid. Um, and they release it into the abdomen where it can be absorbed or it can be eliminated um, and then becomes a part of that normal circulatory process. 
after we release that fluid, um, the brain, the ventricles and the cavities will return back to a normal size. And then you can see some of those are a lot of those symptoms reverse, um, go away or clear up some. So there might be a full recovery, like I mentioned, but also a partial recovery, like gosh, mom is doing so much better. I can still see a little bit of things that have changed, but we're okay. Now she's doing so much better because not everyone will have a complete recovery, but um, you can maintain or sustain where they're at over the long period, over the long term. In the procedure, having that shunt put in, that does carry a risk. So regular follow-up care, regular advocacy, regular, um, if there's any type of changes that you might see, subtle changes, it's really going ahead and saying, okay, there might be another problem there. Let's get in soon to make sure that there's, there's not any longer term consequences for that. But um, so the success of treatment varies from person to person, but they're saying anywhere from 50 to 90% of um, once the person has the shunt put in, they improve by 50 to 90%. So seizures and epilepsy. Um, there are many types of epilepsy and there are different types of seizures. Um, and because each, the effect, it's the effect on the brain, uh, whether it's a different type of seizure or epilepsy, um, each experience is unique. Just like we say for persons with Alzheimer's disease, it's a individualistic disease. You've seen one person diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. You've only seen one person diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So it's the same for seizures and epilepsy. Each experience is unique and different. And how it affects a person can be unique and different. But seizures, they're an individual occurrence that somebody has, um, and it can be caused by a variety of different things. But a seizure is an, irre an irregular electric activity um, inside your brain, the activity of your nerves. Um, the electric, cur electric currents, there's a change and there's an imbalance that happens inside the brain. So if it's a seizure, it can be a one-time thing, um, an individual occurrence. Okay. If you're having two or more seizures, um, or it's a becoming a constant problem or a consistent problem, or you're having reoccurring seizures, um, this is what's known as epilepsy. So you can have a seizure, and not have epilepsy, but you can't have epilepsy without having seizures. Seizures is the, the number one main reason for epilepsy. And they're saying if you have two or more seizures, more than likely you would be diagnosed with a type of ep epilepsy. So the seizure is an abnormal surge of electrical activity between the brain cells. Um, and this can cause temporary abnormalities in muscle tone, movements, behaviors, sensations, or even states of awareness. Not all seizures are alike. Um, and even somebody that has multiple seizures or have epilepsy, each one of their seizures are not all alike. That makes sense. So there's a balance between the excitatory and inhibitory brain cells. Um, excitatory brain cells provide activity. Um, the in inhibitory brain cells help keep things calm or stop the excitement or the activity that happens. When there's an imbalance between those two things, that's when <coughs> a seizure will occur, excuse me, because um, there can be either too much activity um, or too little activity between the imbalance that can happen between those brain cells. So the causes of non-epileptic seizures or those one-time occurring seizures, they're not related to epilepsy, can be a fever. Head injuries, uh, which we saw earlier, can be a cause of that. Any infections um, like meningitis, somebody that's choking, um, somebody's um, withdrawing or detoxing from alcohol or another type of drug as well. A very high blood pressure, untreated, very high blood pressure. A metabolic disorder um, or somebody that's having kidney failure or uh, lung failure, uh, liver, liver failure, excuse me. Really low blood sugar levels, a stroke or a brain tumor. There's a mass inside the brain that can cause those. <clears throat> so there are... Um, types of epilepsy and types of seizures. So a generalized seizure is the seizures happening on both sides of the brain. So you're having that imbalance of those activities on both sides of the brain. A focal um, seizure, focal epilepsy is it happens on one side of the brain. So what this looks like, 
um, changes in brain activity during a seizure. So what seizures can look like, because um, it really can affect a person's level of awareness um, and what their symptoms are when they're having a seizure. So you have a, when your awareness is not really affected um, and they heard these terms, it might be a petite mal seizure. Um, these are typically people that have that focal seizure commonly, and that's where it's happening on one side of the brain. And they generally might not have a loss of awareness of their surroundings during a seizure. Um, but what you can see is there might be a lack of focus. They might stare into space and not be um, not really responsive or responding to anybody trying to get them or get their attention. Um, they can blink rapidly over and over again, or they might have a small a small twitch or really a strange taste in their mouth. Somebody is that their awareness is affected. So they are, they are, are uh, do lose awareness um, of what their surroundings are during a seizure. And we've heard that maybe heard the term grand mal seizure, but generally these look like those people, what you would see is a typical seizure or what we might see um, on TV, but they fall to the ground. Um, they might jerk or convulse, um, or they might have contractions as well. They can be confused, really disoriented, um, and completely unable to respond for minutes to seconds or seconds to minutes. I do have on there, and I'll say not all seizures are alike. Um, so these have, you know, I have those asterisks by there, depending on what seizure or what type of seizure it is, the severity of that seizure. Um, they may be having generalized or focal. It just depends on the severity um, that can happen to them. Another, just a visual on what signs and symptoms of a seizure can be. So confusion, just an acute sudden confusion um, or disorientation about what's going on. An aura, so they're seeing things um, or maybe um, hearing things. And these can be known as triggers. I mean, I can, or I, uh, not a trigger, but a warning sign um, that a seizure is coming on. They can see auras like there's um, little light specks that they see. Sudden falls, and again, of course, uncontrollable movements. Um, or contractions that they have staring for seconds to minutes and we can't can't get their attention strange sensations and emotions the sensation can be a strange sound again an aura they're seeing um, seeing something not a hallucination but it's um, generally they're seeing little spots um, within their vision um, or sensations of anxiety high anxiety at the time and then of course loss of consciousness um, or loss of awareness of what's going on around them other symptoms that we tend to see, and these symptoms uh, we do see more so as in persons that have epilepsy, not somebody that just has a one-time seizure, um, but they're, these are the reoccurrent um, seizures that they're having. And of course, this depends on the severity of the seizure, but that oral unusual sensation, and those typically somebody that has them, they, they use that as a warning sign and might get into a safe position um, or be able to tell somebody I'm about to have a seizure. Um, the anxiousness, mood changes, nausea, dizziness, vision changes. This can be, uh, yeah, I have an aura, um, the tunnel vision as well, and blurry vision. Weakness in muscles, um, headaches, muscle jerking, spasms, balance, loss of balance, teeth clenching, biting of tongue, biting of their tongue, rapid eye movements or rapid blinking, hearing unusual noises, um, a loss of bladder control, confusion, and then a loss of um, consciousness that we can see. So epilepsy, again, is that reoccurring seizures um, with no, really no underlying cause. And here are um, four types of epilepsy. Now, there are several types of epilepsy that are specific to childhood that we're not going to go into, um, but we'll talk about these four here. But it's the progressive myoclonic epilepsy. Um, it's rare, uh, or it has several rare genetic factors to it, and that can stem from a metabolic disorder. Typically, you see this one um, start in late childhood or teen years, <clears throat> and it appears suddenly. Um, you know, the seizure activity comes on suddenly. Um, muscle spasms generally come along with it. Um, weakness, and this can progressively get worse over time if it's not treated. So, getting worse over time as you're seeing more and more seizures um, if it's not being treated. Refractory epilepsy, um, because th this happens, it's a, because you continue, continue um, 
refractory seizures happen even in spite of medication or treatment um, that somebody might have. The reflex epilepsy is involves um, there are the seizures. Seizures are triggered by external stimuli. So there's um, it can be emotions, but it can also be lights. Um, it can be um, sounds or sensations that somebody's having. <clears throat> This is external or internal. Um, this one has a lot to do if you've ever had to have a warning or sign a piece of paper, if there's a strobe light in a room that you're in, it can trigger seizures. Um, that would be the type of seizure or epilepsy somebody might have. So you wanna avoid those triggers if you know that, right? And then photosens photosensitive epilepsy. This is the most common type um, of epilepsy and it's that strobing lights, um, it's triggered by that. And it usually begins during childhood um, and it can lessen um, or completely disappear um, as you go into your adult years. So those are the four more common types of epilepsy that we see. Again, it's a very individualistic um, disorder that somebody lives with. And to diagnose this, um, you wanna rule out any other conditions that might be causing a seizure. Um, you know, we wanna make sure it's not those one time seizure that was maybe caused by medication, diabetes, withdrawal from alcohol or drugs, um, an immune disorder or an infection of some sort. Um, they'll do a complete medical history, a complete medication review, neurological exams to test um, cranial nerves, but also test balances and reflexes as well. They'll do blood work, probably a complete board blood work that includes testing the electric lights and the electrolytes in any other abnormal values um, that could possibly be triggers to seizures. And then brain imaging to look for abnormal masses um, inside the brain. So it's a brain tumor or a buildup of fluid as well um, that will cause pressure on the brain. So it can be a computed um, tomography exam or an MRI. And then the EEG, this is the electroencephalogram. And this shows the patterns of the electrical impulses on the brain. So it would be a given to diagnose the epilepsy and see where it's coming from. And the causes, um, we'll talk about these causes here, um, but there are, there are some times where you don't know what the cause of the epilepsy, ep epilepsy is, or it's of unknown origin, or they call it, call it idiopathic. Um, but stroke is the number one major cause of epilepsy in later life. Of course, head trauma can cause um, epilepsy congenital brain damage, damage from lack of oxygen. Um, this can be a sudden, um, you know, somebody's had a complete cutoff of lack of oxygen. It can also be a buildup of somebody that has sleep apnea that's not being treated. The sleep apnea, you know, not breathing for a little bit while you're sleeping. And if that's not being treated, um, you can have damage, um, brain damage from lack of oxygen that can possibly turn into seizures or epilepsy. Brain tumors, um, uh, withdrawing from drugs and alcohol, and infections like meningitis. Sleep deprivation, poor diet, misusing drugs and alcohol, uh, sedentary, I think sedentary lifestyles or um, having moderate act exercise activity that's appropriate for each person. Um, if those are in the life of somebody that has epilepsy, they're at an increased risk to have more seizures. So it's knowing um, what, if I have epilepsy or if I've had seizures in the past, what are my possible triggers and what can I do to avoid um, possible seizures in the future? So I um, don't want to be sleep deprived, but do want to have a good diet. Um, don't want to abuse drug and alcohol. I do want to have a healthy lifestyle, essentially, because it helps reduce the chances of um, additional seizures. There are medications that can help treat epilepsy and there's several medications out there um, and it helps control the seizure activity. And with these, it might be the doctor has to do some different tests to figure out what's the right medication for you, what type of epilepsy you might have. Um, but also it might take a few times to figure out what medication is right for that person. Just like it is for a lot of um, illnesses or chronic diseases, what's the right medication for that individual. So vagus nerve stimulation um, surgery can help prevent seizures, particularly if there's a mass or fluid buildup in the brain. With these surgeries, um, it's an option. The doctor does need to know exactly where the seizures are beginning in the brain to have a, a surgery seizure procedure like this. 
uh, but that is an option for treatment um, of epilepsy. And then ketogenic diet has been shown <coughs> to, me, to be effective for people with certain types of that refractory epilepsy or that um, external internal stimulation epilepsy that can happen, um, but also persons that might have um, coming off a of medication too. Uh, the diet has been really shown to help um, control the seizures. And other people have reported um, using natural treatments or complementary treatments um, in tandem with the medications that they're taking. This can be herbal um, treatments, vitamin supplements, chiropractic care, acupuncture. I would say for any of these, you always want to talk to a doctor about what you're adding on to, um, to help to make sure that that doesn't interfere with any prescribed medications or contraindicate any prescribed medications or other treatments that somebody might be on under. So there is a list of resources or place to learn more about each one of those disorders. Um, that was, you know, pretty much a high level overview for a lot of that stuff. <clears throat> and then um, resources for caregivers as well, um, particularly if you're caregiving for somebody uh, with a dementia, whether it's a, uh, progressive neurogenerative dementia um, or something body with a brain disorder like this? And how can we, um, what are the best options, treatment and care to keep somebody maintaining the highest quality of life they can, no matter what disease they're living with or what stage of the disease that they're in? That is our information. And I think I've ended a little bit early. <clears throat> Let me stop sharing. Oh. Are there any questions or comments or experiences that anybody wants to share? Okay, well, I will, um, again, I'll send out that follow up email this afternoon. I will have a copy of those slides, a copy of the recording, um, and I will have a copy of upcoming programs that we have for November as well and also a link to the evaluation to obtain your CE credits. Um, you'll have a, probably about a week to complete the evaluation and then we'll get your CE certificate out to you within three weeks, two weeks after you complete the evaluation. So, I re appreciate your time being here. I hope you um, enjoy the 12 extra minutes you have on a Monday. Um, and we hope to see you on a program coming up shortly. Thank y'all. <laughs>